Over the past several years, I have come across several stories in the Globe and Mail that have focused on the what seems to be unstoppable religious nature of human beings. Stories where geneticists would attempt to understand our humanity's ongoing proclivity toward religion by trying to identify, and by, they say, identifying a religious or God gene or stories where neurologists would be doing all kinds of fMRI studies around people who are spiritual, and they would discover that there's a specific region in the brain where it seems that religion or spirituality dwells. Or other stories where anthropologists or evolutionary psychologists would offer a developmental rationale for why we continue to be so religious or evolutionary explanation for why we, see, why we seem to be so prone to seeking out God. All of these stories having that commonality of scientists in these particular cases, but people trying to figure out why human beings continue to be so religious. And we are religious. Not just those of us who are Christians, the billion or so in the world, or those people who make up other world faiths, I think all human beings really are in some way, shape, or form religious. We all put our faith in something, often something bigger than ourselves. For some it might be science. Immediately the scientific fundamentalists may come to mind, Richard Dawkins or Michael Hitchens. For others, we put our faith in a political system, liberal democracy, or in a worldview like secular humanism. And for other of us, uh, others of us, we might that something bigger might be the economy or capitalism. And while capitalism's been a pretty good god to he, us here in Calgary in the last couple of years, not so much for other people in the world. Ask Ireland, who's will be broke for a generation, or the people of Athens right now. Whatever it is, it seems that we all do have this propensity to trust in something bigger than and beyond ourselves and put our faith in terms of how we act and how we have our being into that thing. If you're like me, we probably do it into a lot of things. If you're like me, Sometimes, at the worst of times, and as a Christian, the God is just one slice of those many things. For the people of Athens, 2,000 years ago, most of their religious impulse was directed toward man-made statues, what the Apostle Paul called idols, images of their Greek gods. And to that audience, Paul spoke these words. And the idea is you read this 2,000-year-old story thinking that if it's a God-authored story, there may be truths or principles or something there that can speak today to your life, to my life. So Paul is meeting with a whole bunch of Stoic and Epicurean philosophers. They're not sure exactly where, but he figures, they figure maybe, you know, City Hall or the place where all those philosophers met, met what they call the Areopagus. And Athens was the intellectual center of the world. And so here comes the Apostle Paul with this story about Jesus. And uh, he's trying to engage these people who have no idea, obviously, about what that story is. So engaging this crowd in that place, Paul says this. It is plain to see that you Athenians take your religion seriously. This is from the message translation of the Bible. It's plain to see that you Athenians take your religion seriously. When I arrived here the other day, I was fascinated with all the shrines I came across. And then I found one inscribed, To the God nobody knows. I'm here to introduce you to this God so that you can worship intelligently, know who you're dealing with. The God who made the world and everything in it, this master of sky and land, doesn't live in custom-made shrines or need the human race to run errands for him. 
as if he couldn't take care of himself. He makes the creatures. The creatures don't make him. Starting from scratch, he made the entire human race and made the earth hospitable with plenty of time and space for living so that we could seek after God and not just grope around in the dark, but actually find him. He doesn't play hide-and-seek with us. He's not remote. He's near. We live and move in him, can't get away from him. One of your poets said it well, we're the God created. Well, if we're the God created, it doesn't make a lot of sense to think that we could hire a sculptor to chisel a God out of stone for us, does it? God overlooks it as long as you don't know any better, but that time has passed. The unknown is now known, and he's calling for radical life change. And he set a day when the entire human race will be judged and everything set right. And he has already appointed the judge, confirming him before everyone by raising him from the dead. At the phrase, quote, raising him from the dead, unquote, the listeners split. Some laughed at him and walked off making jokes. Others said, let's do this again. We want to hear more. But that was it for the day, and Paul left. There were still others, it turned out, who were convinced then and there and stuck with Paul. Among them, a man named Dionysius, the Arapagite, and a woman named Damaris. The Word of God. As I was studying that and studying that and studying that speech, that sermon this week, I realized that a lot of what Paul was saying to the Athenians about their stone statues and idol worship had strong connection to the same kind of very human tendency that is alive in our still pretty religious world today. Paul said, when I arrived here the other day, I was fascinated with all the shrines I came across, and then I found one inscribed to the God nobody knows, segue of segues, what a great rhetoric move on Paul's part. The Athenians who talked ideas all the time would have loved that he was a smart dude and a great speaker. Then I found one inscribed to the God nobody knows. I'm here to introduce you to this God so you can worship him intelligently and know who you're dealing with. I love how he refers to God already sets a foundation in that last phrase. I'm here to introduce you to this God so you can worship intelligently and know who, who you're dealing with. From the get-go, Paul is saying that God is a person, a being, not just an idea, oh, esteemed intellectual Athenians, for whom I'm sure many of them God was a concept, a thought, something to be considered, debated, relegated, put aside, accepted or not, held in our mere human created minds. So when Paul starts off by presenting a personal God, he probably had these Athenian philosophers' attention. God is a being, God is alive not just a worldview, not just a set of ethical considerations or moral beliefs or values. God is a person in our context, three persons, one being. Paul goes on, the God who made, filling out the definition of God, the God who made the world and everything in it, this master of sky and land, doesn't live in custom-made shrines or need the human race to run errands for him, as if he couldn't take care of himself. He makes the creatures. The creatures don't make him. To a bunch of people who've made all of these God statues, that sometimes those things do become idols and become God to people, or too much to people. Starting from scratch, he made the entire human race and made the earth hospitable with plenty of time and space for living so we could seek after God, 
and not just grope around in the dark, but actually find Him. He doesn't play hide-and-seek with us. He's not remote. He's near. So now Paul fills out God as a person, details about who that person is, what God did in creating all things. And first of all, that is who, first and foremost, that is who God is in Paul, Paul's mind. So God, if God created everything, well then that God cannot even begin to fit within that little three-pound bit of gray matter that sits between your ears. And no human being and no collective force of philosophers and thinkers and scientists can begin as the created to fully name and know and define who God is. He cannot be captured, therefore, by the work of our hands or by a theory or a philosophy or a worldview or relegated to just the spiritual part of your life. If God is the God who made everything, if you're believing in that, then to give God a slice of your life is a joke. God didn't, God wasn't made by us. He made us. That kind of God, if that is who God is by definition, demands a different response on your knees, <laughs> all of me, humility. No longer can I put him, God, where I want to. And then Paul says in that verse I just read that we can know despite God being all of these things or because God is all of these things, God also says that we can know Him, that He made this world hospitable as it was so that we would be able to move around and not have to grope, but actually see and know God. God doesn't play hide-and-seek. He's not remote. He's near. And we're made to know God. And Paul continues, quote, we live and move in Him. We can't get away from Him. One of your poets, your Greek poets, said it well. We're the God created. Well, if we are the God created, it doesn't make a lot of sense to think we could hire a sculptor to chisel out a God of stone for us, does it? It doesn't make a lot of sense that God could be something that we could totally control and carry around in our back pocket or relegate or ignore Paul is actually quoting two Greek thinkers in this quote. The uh, we live and move in him and can't get away from him quote comes from a Cretan poet named Epimenides, and the one that's cited as a quote, where the God created, comes from a Cilician poet named Aratus. And both poets, in writing their poems of worship, were writing worship words to Zeus. So evidently, the Greeks, prior to Christ, in the poetry of these poets, knew something true about the nature of God, so true that the Apostle Paul could quote them verbatim in describing who he believes God is. God doesn't live and move in us. We live and move in Him. We don't make God. God made us. And what the Greeks aimed at Zeus, Paul aimed at the Christian God, the God that we believe is a person that created everything, that is knowable, and that is near. So what Richard Dawkins aims at the God of what we'll call capital S scientism and his worldview, we in our community, when we preach science all the time, and we're going to continue to do that all the time, we are taking those truths and aiming them at the God of all creation who made the cosmos that Dawkins is going on and on and on about. So truth in evolutionary theory, where it is truth, reveals something of who God is, as does Big Bang, Large Hadron Collider truth and geophysical truth and kidney truth. 
preaching the kidney this fall. It's part of a five-series, five-message series on science. We just applied to the Templeton Foundation and asked them for $30,000 to fund a church looking at the intersection of faith and science. Why wouldn't we? It's all God's anyway. We'll use the word of the science to talk to the word of the Bible, and we'll do our thing at New Hope and hopefully get a free field trip to the new TELUS World of Science out of this deal as well. Foundations allow us to do that. All right, back to point. I just had to share that story. I'm so excited. I worked for a week on that this past week. What Dawkins aims at the God of scientism, we take and aim at the God of all creation. What Plato contributed to the Greek concept and philosophy of what a god was, the church for the first 1,200 years of church history took and aimed at a god who is near and knowable. We took Neoplatonic ideas of a God who reveals Himself through material reality in some mysterious way and wove it into an idea called sacramentalism that says that God can speak to us through bread and wine, through witnessing a baptism, through the birth of a baby, through family, through a mountain, through a river. God can take what you value so much and hold high as your raison d'etre and your reason for being. What you find meaningful and significant and true and ultimate. And He can shake us awake and say it's not actually the ultimate and somehow make that thing translucent or like a mirror reflecting Him. Or in another mysterious way can say, actually, what you're looking for here is me, because I made that thing, that great way to form a society, that beautiful piece of nature, that baby. So that we can see Him as the Lord and the giver of everything the one through whom you're meant to say thanks and then have such joy and life and love cherishing. The joy of the thing is meant to be enjoyed with Him. The love of the thing is meant to be embraced by His love. The thing of the thing, the rightness, the truth, its beauty is meant to be enveloped in His mind and beauty, his heart. God, maybe God does want that transition to happen in all of us, or maybe, and maybe he'll speak to you or me that way, or maybe he'll speak to you more directly, which is what Paul does near the end of his little sermon. In fact, getting right into the face of those people with the ridiculous message of the gospel. God overlooks our idolatry as long as we don't know any better, but that time has passed. The unknown is now known, and He, again personal, He's calling for a radical life change. And He has set a day when the entire human race will be judged and everything set right. And He's already appointed the judge, Jesus Christ, confirming Him before everyone by raising Him from the dead. At that phrase, raising Him from the dead, the listeners split. Some laughed at Him and walked off making jokes. Others said, let's do this again. We want to hear more. But that was it for the day, and Paul left. And there were still others, it turned out, who were convinced then and there and stuck with Paul. Jesus Christ, the quite arguably hinge of history, all of time measured as either being before or after Him, is a stone upon which you can build your life or one that you won't even see or recognize and might even trip over. Causes many people to stumble even as it brings such life to others. Resurrected from the dead, which is ridiculous. But if God is God, 
and God made everything out of nothing, then what is it to God to raise one person from the dead? What is it to God to raise a whole people over millennia, over the history of the cosmos from the dead? What is it to God to reach into your soul and wake it up? Or yours, family's soul, and whisper life? What is it to God to save any of us?